Thank you to you, not, not just thank you for being here at this event, which is very much appreciated, but the, as I've gone around the room, there's a lot of people here, probably all of you, that have made some major contributions to the politics of the country, the politics of the province, and uh, just want to thank you for that participation. More people did some of the things that you do, I think the country would be in better shape. Uh, this book that I, I've written is uh, it's called Do Something. It's basically prompted by two concerns. One, one that uh, I feel that democracy is in, in trouble. Uh, the, the, the voter turnout is declining and the, the number of people that express it just a, a lack of faith in the democratic institutions and the parties and the candidates. Uh, I think it's worse, but I think there's things can be done. So this book's got a whole list of things. I've collected ideas over the years of things that could be done to strengthen democracy and, and I list a lot of them in the book. And then on the conservative side, I think it's imperative to strengthen conservatism. In the last century, conservatives won one out of three elections at the federal and provincial level. And I think the objective should be to win two out of three in the 21st century. But in order to do that, uh, conservatism needs strengthening in, in, a, in a variety of ways, intellectually, uh, skill-wise, and, uh, and in its position in Canada. So I've got a whole list. There's about 400 to do things in that book, and uh, hopefully one of them or two of them will resonate with you, and uh, and it will accomplish the objective. Now, now what I thought I might do, and I'm conscious that you're all standing, so you might be getting weary very quick, but uh, I just give you a bit of a sample of what's uh, in there under the do uh, under the democracy uh, heading. Uh, I, I spend a little time on just telling the democracy story and encouraging people to do that, particularly with younger people, even with children. If you try to describe democracy in terms of legal uh, and political science terms, you just turn off, particularly younger people. But if you tell it as a story that started 26 centuries ago in, in ancient Greece and, and tell it as a story rather than as a sort of a political science doctrine, I think you get a lot uh, further with uh, younger people. I've got another thing, a chapter on strengthening relations between the science community and the political community. You know, science is such a dominant uh, force in, in our society, but there's a gap between the political people and the scientists. In, in that federal parliament, you can count on one hand the number of people with a genuine science background. And when they put on that science policy conference in the, uh, Ottawa, where there's a lot of the scientists, there, there are not more than a dozen political people go there. So I think there's a lot to be done there and using science to strengthen uh, uh, democracy. Well, one other thing to touch on is uh, our, we did a survey of millennials uh, a couple of years ago where we asked them, among other things, where do you put yourself on the left, center, right spectrum? And one of the major responses was, we don't like that spectrum. We, we don't differ. They said, they said, you old guys just constantly discuss politics in terms of center, left, and right, but we don't. And so we, we put on a number of receptions of trying to find what are there other axes that you can connect young people with and a democracy axis. Do you favor decision making by large numbers of people through democratic processes, or do you prefer more expert, top down kind of decision? We had a whole bunch of these axes trying to redefine political space for millennials to get more engagement. There's a big chapter in that. But the, uh, the number one thing I'll just stress on the uh, strengthening democracy is uh, I think a major effort has to be made to increase the knowledge and skills and ethical foundations of the people that participate, particularly at the elected level. <coughs> to, uh, to work for Starbucks, to be a barista, you've got to have 15 hours of training to know the difference between a latte and a and a mocha, but you can become a lawmaker in that parliament in Ottawa, which just came from there, or in your legislature without one hour of training in lawmaking. Like, does this make sense? Did this country spend $1.5 billion per year on the operational side of the federal parliament, the 10 provincial legislature? This is paying the salaries, put, keeping the lights on, all, all of that. Uh, but virtually zero on training people that are in there are preparing, helping them to be prepared when they get there. It, I know I shouldn't draw this analogy, but making laws is a little bit like making sausages. You don't know, want to know what's in them sometimes. <laughs> Suppose you had a sausage making company that had 14 uh, factories and was spending $1.5 billion a year on, on just the operational side of it, but spent nothing on training the sausage makers. And, for, and particularly, there's 20, 25% turnover every four years in that institution. But that sausage company would not last for six months. But 
that's what we're doing. <laughs> well, that's what we're so strike team that all just feels through through training. And uh, a number of years back, I went up when I got out of the parliament, or Sam says I shouldn't say it that way because it sounds like I was in a penitentiary. But when I, got out of the I, I interviewed the speaker and the clerk. <coughs> And I interviewed the speakers and the clerks of all 10 legislatures and the three territorial ones. And I asked them, you've seen hundreds and hundreds of people come through your chambers. Uh, if you could uh, provide some training material or some introductory material or something that would help them to be better prepared, what would it be? And I got this list of about 25 courses. And I've been sort of spreading this around to some of the education institutions. One of the main ones, they're trying to talk UBC into creating a, a hundred seat replica of the House of Commons, an actual replica of the House of Commons with all the committee rooms and media rooms and everything else. And the idea is it would be a heavy duty training chamber for people to think they want to get into elected office. And uh, uh, so do, in the doing something, anything you can do to strengthen the knowledge, skills, ethical foundation of people that are getting into it, uh, I think you'd be in a great service to uh, democracy. <coughs> Okay, then on the conservative side, I got the uh, an, <coughs> excuse me, I got a number of chapters. Well, one on the need for periodic political realignments. Uh, I, I think from time to time you have to reshuffle the pieces in the political arena, even on the conservative side. And I'm involved in this type of thing. Uh, you know, Reform Party would eventually put it together with progressive conservative parties in three provinces to create the Canadian Alliance. And then Stephen Harper and Peter McKay put this the, that together with, and you got a governing conservative party. Here in Saskatchewan, the uh, the Saskatchewan party was as a result of a political realignment. The UCP in Alberta is the same thing. The Yukon party is the same thing. And, and you, you don't want to do these realignments every day, but every 10, 15 years, you can look at the structure. Do we got to change the structure in, in order to be more relevant? And then some people resist that and say, no, no, if you're conservative and if you're, you should just be consistent, say the same thing, point direction, just don't change the thing. And I, I used to be in the uh, consulting business in, in north central Alberta. There used to be a sign uh, up, up in that area that had the word Sawridge on it and an arrow pointing west. And, and this sign, it was on a huge post, it was bolted to that. Uh, that post and it, it never changed its direction, it never changed its message in 50 years. And the only thing wrong with it is if you follow the directions on that sign, you would never get to the town of Sorry. <laughs> and why was that? Because over the 50 years, the town had moved its location. <laughs> and and, and the, uh, uh, everything else around it had changed, but it hadn't. So the very fact that it didn't change made it a symbol of error rather than than accuracy. So I, th I think there is a place for these political realignments. I've got a, a chapter on that. Um, I, I could run over a number of things here, but let me just stress one other thing. And then, then I want to get on to populism and Western alienation. But uh, the, the, our observations of the conservative movement is that maybe because we tend to be individualistic and uh, entrepreneurial, but the, the conservative movement is in silos. These conservative provincial parties do very little with each other and very little with the federal party. The conservative think tanks and advocacy groups keep themselves fairly well. They don't, they, I think sometimes if they do things together, they're afraid of losing donors to the other guys so they don't do it. And, and I think that is a weakness of conservatism. And the way you overcome it, as Troy was saying, is, is by more intensive networking more together. Like right now, there's seven nominally, at least, uh, conservative provincial governments. Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, New Brunswick is hanging by a thread. Uh, and on a good day, the CAQ in Quebec and, and PEI. Uh, if, you, if you put the, the door knocking capacity, the fundraising capacity, the uh, memberships of those parties together with the federal party, you have the strongest political force in the country. It's three and a half times the size of the federal liberal party. If it acted as an army, but if everybody acts as a platoon, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have that strength. So as Troy said, we, we've been putting on these networking conferences. Now we're going to put on more of these on a regional basis. This one is on March 26, 28, and you're certainly invited to, to be there. Uh, we're also going to change, it's been called the Manning Conference. But we want to change the name to put more of the focus on conservative. We change the name. 
and, and that's what uh, and Troy is going to be the president and the guy that's uh, ramrodding that. I still have my name. We have this foundation, so I'll be more connected with it. So I've still got my name somewhere. But the center is going to be <laughs> focused on networking and uh, and things like that. Okay, and then the, the, the last thing I wanted to talk on, and I'll take a couple of minutes on this because it's so important, is uh, I, I have two chapters in this book on populism and Western alienation. And those of you, I know there's a lot in this room that know the history of Western Canada. Western Canada has had more experience with populist movements, populist parties, and populist governments than virtually any other area of North America. We don't get credit for it. But if there's one part of the country that ought to understand populism, both its positive sides and negative side, it ought to be as you can. If you think the, the old progressive party in the 1920s, the party actually that got women the vote and that uh, got uh, women recognized as persons in Canadian law, all of those people, were, that was a populist party. All that famous five, they all came from populist movements. The farmers' parties were populist bottom-up movements. In the Depression, your province and, and our, my province, it created two political parties, and they were these bottom-up parties, the CCF, which eventually became the NDP Social Credit in, in Alberta in the late 1980s and, and early 90s for four months, a bottom-up populist movement. If anybody ought to understand populism, it ought to be the web. But, and the question then arises, how do you react to a populist party? Now, how do the political elites react? And, and I want to suggest to do this in the book. The worst possible reaction is to ignore what they're doing and saying. Or, or to be contemptuous at it. It is a bunch of ignorant people that don't know what's good for them. They'll probably be chasing after some charismatic leader that'll lead them over the cliff. I, I think that's the worst possible reaction. And it tends to be the reaction of political elites. That, that's the reaction to the Trump phenomenon in the US, and they're going to re-elect the guy just because of that reaction. That was the reaction to Brexit, and look where that went. Uh, so that, I think that's the wrong reaction, because then people say, okay, well, what's the right reaction? You Westerners, you should understand this, so we've got to have some answer to that. So I, I say there's three things to respond to a populist movement, and I'm going to connect it to this current Western alienation. And the first thing is recognize populism, bottom-up political energy, as a legitimate form of democratic uh, exercise. But whether you agree with it or not, this is ordinary people that have got to exercise, they're do, doing something, uh, and you should recognize the legitimacy of, of that phenomenon. The second one is to identify the root causes of what's causing that uprise. What, what, what's behind it? What's beneath it? What's the root causes of it? And then the third, uh, thing is to try to take that energy that is generated bottom-up political energy and, and direct it towards constructive solutions to the problems that are at, at the bottom. And uh, I, I think if that's done, that that's an appropriate uh, uh, response. Uh, if if we apply this then to the this current state of of Western alienation and the the, the political unrest that is out there, even creating uh, uh, interest in, in secession. Uh, for first thing, if we, it should be to recognize the legitimacy. People that are mad, they've got a right to be mad. Westerners got a right to be mad. They've got a right to express it. There's a legitimacy to it. Uh, but the second thing is to get to the roots. Now, what's at the root of this current alienation and this expression? The, the basic root of it is that the West is treated unfairly in the Federation. It's treated unfairly in the Constitution. It's unfairly represented in the federal parliament, in the House of Commons, particularly in the Senate, and in the, the federal civil servant. It's unfairly represented with respect to equalization and federal transfers and federal uh, joint provincial uh, uh, programs. It's unfairly treated with its inability to get uh, unobstructed transportation corridors to the Atlantic and the Pacific. Uh, there's an unfairness. There's a root of uh, the unfairness. Uh, and so then the third question then comes to what, what can you do about it? And, and I want to suggest, there's, and I get into this a bit in the book, there's two responses that one can take to address this unfairness. The first one is to define what would constitute a fair deal for the West. Like it's already right to say it's all unfair. Okay, what, would, what would be a fair deal? What would be a fair equalization program? What would be fair with respect to representation and so forth? And of course, this is something your premier is on, and, and Premier Kenny and 
Alberta set up this fair deal panel. That, that's exactly what it's supposed to do. Okay, recognize the unfairness. What are, can be done to address the specific aspects of unfairness? And uh, my, my personal, uh, well, then what I think should be done is then to press the federal government and the rest of Canada, including a coalition of some of these other conservative governments, to get action on those fairness uh, proposals. And, and an analogy I use on uh, in, in this area is one from the oil patch, which there's oil patch people here. You know, in the oil patch, there's such a thing as a wildcat well that's drilled into a formation where you don't know what's down below. And then there's such a thing as a rope well. If you hit a pocket of oil and gas under enormous pressure, it can blow the drilling platform off the wellhead, it can catch fire, it can be a very dangerous thing. But on the other hand, there's a lot of energy there, and if you can capture it, and try, it it's a valuable energy, it can be used for valuable purposes. And one of the ways the oil patch deals with a rope well is to drill in a relief well from the side. It has to be just the right angle. It has to connect with the root cause of the well, but it takes some of the pressure off and allows you to bring uh, install valves and bring that well into production. And in many respects, the Reform Party of the late 1980s and 90s was a relief well drilled into the very strong Western sentiment at that time. Recognized that a right to be mad, a right to think about suffering and everything else, but tried to channel it into reforms that would make the thing better rather than kick the whole thing apart. So uh, I think that's one of the responses to this Western alienation. Let's identify what the fair deal would be. Let's rally and support not just among our usual friends, but the broadest possible support we can to bring pressure on the federal government and the rest of Canada to get action on those items. The second possible response is to uh, examine this as a separatist option if, if numbers uh, warrant, if enough people want that done. And uh, my own view on that is much more work has to be done by the people that are advocating uh, secession to make it a credible option. The, the current option, the current emphasis, particularly in Alberta and Saskatchewan, is just on Alberta and Saskatchewan. When F.W.G. Hall Payne wanted to name the, the Great West Province Buffalo, he was not just talking about Alberta and Saskatchewan. He was talking about the big Northwest, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, the Yukon, and the Northwest Territory. He was talking about an area of almost three million square kilometers, not just 660,000, which is Alberta, or not just 650,000, which is, is Saskatchewan. And, and if you're going to want to impress the rest of the country, you can impress them maybe by saying, we're going to take off Alberta and Saskatchewan. You, you want to impress them and say, we're going to take half the country. <laughs> that, that gets people's attention. So I, I do think the secession movement's got a lot of work to do to, to flesh out and broaden itself. And secondly, to answer some of the unanswered questions, which, which so far have not been answered. What's the constitution going to be in this new country? You can't get people to join a new country unless you tell them what the constitution is. How, how is being a new country going to actually get us pipelines east and west? We can't do it within federation. You think we can do it as a foreign country? There's a whole bunch of questions that could be answered. But uh, what I'm suggesting to you is that, that there is this unrest. It is a populist movement. It's got to be legitimately recognized. Trying to get this fair deal for a bigger, broader uh, Northwest is one option. The separatist option is going to be there, but there's a lot of work and questions that got to be answered on that before uh, I think thinking people will get on board. So that's enough for me. I, I'll circle it around also. I'll sign some of these books, and if you've got other questions <coughs> for me, I, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much.